Welcome to the Privacy APN channel. We are currently in the stone age of internet. We still don't fully know the long term impacts of the digital footprint we leave on the internet, its collection, analysis and usage, potentially to manipulate our thoughts and decision making. If left uncontrolled, AI systems can completely manipulate and control decision making of every human being in every aspect of life and we may just become slaves to AI systems with maximum data and compute power in a way. In the Privacy APN channel, we will speak with researchers, business leaders and policy makers to create awareness about emerging privacy regulatory requirements, cutting edge technologies and solutions in the area of privacy. Welcome once again to Privacy APN channel. Please do subscribe to the channel to get regular updates on emerging privacy trends. For today's curtain raiser session, we have a very special guest, uh, Professor Himan Shutyagi. He is Associate Professor at IISC and is one of the brightest minds in the country in the area of privacy technologies. He teaches at IISC in the areas of uh, informatic theoretic security and artificial intelligence. His interests and in research are in the areas of information theory, statistics, cryptography, machine learning, distributed intelligence system, and uh, socio-technical systems. Uh, beyond uh, being a cutting edge researcher and professor in India's top premium institute, he is also an entrepreneur and founder of a stealth mode startup. It's a pleasure to have you here, Professor Himanshu. Thank you for joining. Thanks for inviting Abhilash. Thanks. Good to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, in this topic of privacy, it's a very intriguing topic and it's an emerging topic. Uh, first of all, would like to have a much broader perspective of uh, what is privacy? Why is it being considered as a fundamental right? Uh, what's your take on that? Right. So in my view, privacy is basically an individual's right to keep data about themselves to themselves. In one sense, we have always understood the importance of privacy. You know, we have seen in movies and different stories about countries doing espionage to figure out information about one particular individual, one special individual whose privacy, private information is very important for strategic reasons. And we have seen all of that. Uh, but now we are thinking of privacy as a right of every individual, you, me, our families. Right. And we have the right that no one makes our data available to anyone else without first getting a consent from us. Uh, because we are vulnerable in many serious ways to anyone who has data about us. And it is a job of our elected governments or society to protect us from such attacks. So in this sense, this is a right which was always there for the chosen few. And now as we move forward, we, we want to see this right happening for everyone. Great. So that's why you think it is the right time to, uh, for it to become a fundamental right. Yeah, absolutely. And not just me, uh, people across the globe are now talking about it and their documentaries, which you may have seen about it. And this is a, this is a rising concern. The social dilemma. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to plug in anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what is the context with India? For example, we are one of the, we are the largest democracy in the world with 1.3 billion people uh, with, uh, with a huge uh, young population with more than 600, 600 million people uh, with internet access. Um, and we have, we have had a history in a sense, like we have had internet and people have been used to uh, using these uh, technologies, uh, uh, using social media platforms and accessing internet, et cetera. So why can't we just continue doing it? What, uh, what is the challenge in that? Yeah, so that's a great question. If there's something special for the Indian context here. Uh, so what I would like to bring out is not just the Indian, but the global context, but here is one thing. So recently, I mean, we are back in sort of a semi lockdown, but we had a sort of a relaxed period few months back and uh, some visitors from abroad started coming back and I had some friends visiting and they were all amazed to see how digitized India is just in mm -hmm. two years. Since we are inside, we don't see it, but the mm -hmm. fact that everything is online, our deliveries, all of our things are online and how digitized our homes are becoming, especially for those of us who can afford some basic gadgets. It's, it's a remarkable feat. Our country has done a tremendous job in taking everyone's data making it structured and making it available for the broader good. They've done a remarkable job there. And the kind of services that the Indian uh, consumer is getting, the kind of technology that we are now consuming is just tremendous. I, for instance, love this uh, okay, a small plugin. I love Google Home because I have Google Home. You may love Amazon Alexa. I love Google Home. 
and i love for it to control my tv my speakers my lights my fan everything hmm. uh but you know how it does it it is basically building a model which allows it to interpret my voice and i don't know what google does but typically when you do this there are many techniques one common technique can be uh, this is a common technique in machine learning that not only i build a model to understand the data to in, to get to to interpret the data but i also build a model together with it to generate data this is a learning technique so what happens if google or some other company is doing it this at the back end is not only they understand my command they can mimic my voice okay so this is what they are doing but i never allowed them to do that i hope google is not doing that <laughs> because you can now imagine if these models which are sort of deep fake voice models are built for all of us mm. and they can reproduce the voice that we have this is this is a very personal thing to me it, in fact it's it's an authentication parameter of yeah. course uh, of course you can you can somehow go very deep and figure out it's not me speaking and all that but mm. this is a huge vulnerability i'm just giving you an example of a technology which is rising very quickly in india all companies are going very hard on building uh, speech models for indians because we can the, the usage is just tremendous right it, we we will basically stop using this typing remotes and we'll just speak shout commands Correct. which i do at in my home to yeah. not just, not just to play music but to control a fan light everything but there is a vulnerability that comes with it so and so for example you know deep fake videos are much more uh, it may be much more easier to create with all this um, attributes being captured it becomes much more easier to create a deep fake video of anybody which may which may not have been possible earlier right right so and and the point is i never allowed them to do that mm. what i allowed them to even when i was giving us permission in my understanding of course i may have signed for everything <laughs> but in my understanding the consent that i gave was to allow them to use my data to allow me to control my fan my tv and that's it not to i'd never allowed them to mimic my voice in any mm. way and, and i hope they're not doing it but my point is this is this kind of vulnerabilities are indeed real mm. we are not sure what they are doing what they are not doing and it is in some sense this is something beyond an individual citizen to protect it's the job of the government to make sure that as we as our population adopts these technologies and it's the job of the governments to make sure that we are all protected against these technology giants uh, again i will <laughs> uh, i i think everyone is towards the greater good but these vulnerabilities exist correct we you never know when it falls into which hands and how yeah. it will be made use of and uh, there is always uh, this you know pressure for making more profit and we don't know how they will use our data to uh, to those ends which is a very very tricky uh, scenario and as you rightly put uh, regulation has to come in so right uh, yeah great um, so um, how does having now from a business perspective how do you think having a strong regulation privacy regulation can be helpful because we are taking the other side of the table and seeing uh, you know let us say you know indian startups or indian companies now with privacy regulation coming in india is it a restriction or a burden or is it an enabler or how do you look at it okay this is the age old privacy dilemma right is it a who is it for is it for the consumer and if they are not asking for it why would the company take this overhead is it an overhead for them mm-hmm. and i just explained why this is something of fundamental importance for consumers for users and individuals mm-hmm. and uh, it may not it may not it may look like a burden for companies but let me try to explain why i think it's not necessarily a burden for the companies it will help the companies eventually even now it will help the company now to bring in so first thing we must realize is that to extract maximum value from data the companies need to have greater access to data Okay, and they need to be able to freely share it across their teams, and they need to be able to freely share it to teams which are outside their organization. Right? Mm. They should be able to do all that. Now, an aware customer like you, like me, which are typically high-value customers, these are the early adopters of technology, and uh, people living in cities in India and tier two, tier three cities in India. I would categorize all of them as aware customer or soon to be aware customers. Right? As mm. as awareness improves. uh we we will all be aware about this privacy vulnerabilities this aware customers may object to sharing any personal data such as location purchase data mm-hmm. because it can result in a serious pre- uh, uh privacy vulnerability however once such customer is assured that privacy will not be compromised either the company will use some advanced things like pri- differential privacy to add noise or they will follow some secure computing paradigms there are such technologies 
from to ensure that only the required intelligence is extracted from the data once we are assured of such a thing we'll be willing to participate in this greater uh, business ecosystem resulting in larger revenues for company this is one point that you have to the the, the target customer for technology companies is such that they will be aware of this vulnerability and they have to take care of these customers so you are basically saying that there will be a network effect which would kick in as people you know the most influential people will start pushing for these uh, you know privacy protected ecosystems and companies and the word of mouth would sort of st- start spreading people they would get more valuable data from valuable customers and that would result in you know more adoption in those platforms which are guaranteeing privacy that way it will become a uh, you know the future platforms is that what yeah. you are uh, hinting to no, this is also this is slightly related point and I, yeah this is also a very interesting point i was not saying that but this is also a very interesting point what you raised that uh, if customers somewhere else are requiring this as a feature mm-hmm. then customers globally will buy this feature in this kind of people mm-hmm. will understand and this network effect will kick in in mm-hmm. terms of awareness as well mm-hmm. i was just pointing out that if you want more data you should make sure that it's protected now yeah this is one point the second point is advanced markets like europe mm-hmm. where people uh, it turns out people there are europe is a very good example here because mm-hmm. turns out people in europe are the most privacy sensitive mm-hmm. and uh, and these markets are already there so for indian companies specifically if they are looking for a global footprint mm-hmm. uh, they would have no option but to include privacy from there it's 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 already done now it's not something right. that happened <laughs> five years down the line because right. i uh, if you talk to someone their thought may be that okay this will kick in 10 years down the line we'll revisit mm-hmm. it's not mm-hmm. going to kick in it's now it's happening now mm-hmm. there are very elaborate privacy laws coming in globally including india uh, which mm-hmm. is uh, something uh, we may discuss right and it's happening now so if you want to have a global footprint it's of it's in your interest to make sure that you take care of privacy of your user data mm-hmm. and finally i'll say that this is the right thing to do i <laughs> strongly believe that <laughs> business good and social good right they're not two separate and they would not be even two separate going forward mm-hmm. uh, we are very young into this internet entrepreneurial ecosystem and just a few decades maybe maybe okay even half a century if you include everything extrapolate every way that's that's not old enough uh, and i think eventually it will in long term things tend to converge with <laughs> social good and i think it's it's the right thing to do to have privacy taken care of that's a beautiful point you know so business good and social good coming together and it's right time for this have to right have to yeah. right? absolutely at the end uh, there is no malicious player <laughs> <laughs> true so uh, why has the you know recently there was you know jpc had uh, submitted their um, personal data protection bill draft version modified um, and very interestingly uh, they have um, not just named this personal data protection bill which was the previous name and they have uh, now made it as a data protection bill which has which is covering both personal and non personal data so if you can give us some context because you have been working with iudx and other uh, ecosystems and non personal data is very important so if you can provide some light about what is non personal data what is personal data how it differs and what's the uh, importance so personal data is exactly what it sounds like your name your phone number your address all those things that can reveal your identity that's your personal data there is a a more technical definition this is a very obvious definition personal data is my data my name my phone number and such right there is a slightly more technical definition any data that is so unique to you mm. that by looking at its value i can identify you is your personal data mm. so for example just to take an interesting example your height is not a personal data generally but if your height is 251 cm then i know you are the tallest person in the world so you must be sultan person Mm. tallest person in the world i looked this yeah. up yeah. so <laughs> so he's a turkish guy who is 251 cm the tallest so. person in the world and so what it is from this realization the fact that distinction between this personal and non personal data is a technical one perhaps this realization prompted the lawmakers to address data protection as a whole rather than limiting to personal data otherwise you will need another bill to clarify what is personal data so this mm. this is this goes uh, this distinction itself is not so easy Mm. as i just pointed out and mm. that's why it's all coming under this data protection bill nice uh, so it it sort of uh, provides a broader perspective and how how does non personal data 
Now you spoke about personal data, which directly helps in identifying uh, direct or indirect, but helps in identifying a person, as you said, in terms of 251 centimeters, somebody, and then you can identify uh, who that person is. So how do you differentiate non-personal data? And uh, if you can give some examples of non-personal data. Okay, this is a very interesting question. And uh, in, in some sense, it is still not settled hmm. completely theoretically, hmm. what will be non-personal and personal. So uh, it's an important research agenda for anyone looking at uh, privacy. Mm. So, so uh, I've already given a hint earlier, right? Mm. That your height is so, if your height is so unique to you, mm. then it is no longer non-personal data. Otherwise, height yeah. is a very commodity statistic. If I mm. tell you that someone is uh, 160, 170 centimeter mm. male, uh, mm. not giving away much information about who this person is mm. in mm. Indian context. Mm. Uh, the way height doesn't remain personal data is because there's the, there's a lot of public knowledge about a distribution of this. And then there's a Wikipedia article on the tallest person arrive, which I can look up and figure out where the extremes of this thing. So what I'm trying to bring out is that what allows us to identify the person from his extraordinary height is some side information, some other information, which is even outside the data we are talking about. I just reveal height. But then I went outside and I collected other data and I was able to demystify who this person is. Now imagine a more general database with many, many columns. Like this is how some, some, something more boring than height, more, uh, more columns. Some of them are personal to you, your phone number, name, etc. as I said earlier, the others are non-personal. So let's take a very specific example, the ratings of different movies, say, you know, some old Hindi movie, these three months that my parents are watching it yesterday it came to my mind and some new Telugu movie, Pushpa. <laughs> so all the ratings are there and other movies, many of them. Mm. Now, one can think that mm. if you just remove my name, everything, and just reveal his ratings, movie names and my ratings for it, mm. it will not reveal my identity. Mm. And we can call it non-personal data, naively. Mm. Mm. But in fact, that's what Netflix thought. Mm. And they took this data, just the movie ratings, released it publicly, declared a data challenge for their recommendation engine. Mm. And you know what people did? People as in uh, very established researchers, mm. uh, what they did, they correlated these ratings with publicly available ratings mm. given by famous critics, mm. movie critics. Mm. And they identified some of these larger Netflix rating as belonging to this particular critic. Mm. And you know what? It mm. was not only for the movies which people thought this guy will watch, mm. it was for many more movies. Mm. So what it revealed to people, it can reveal to people, it did reveal to people, is some mm. of the new movie names mm. which you typically won't imagine this critic to watch. Mm. And mm. even knowing that someone like that watches that movie, <laughs> is 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 a it may be a dent on their reputation yeah yeah absolutely it can and, be you know some movies which are which he does not want that he yeah. keys of his preference and exactly. um, you know it and, can and be for a, such a such as for such a profession i mean reputation is everything and so this is basically a direct attack on livelihood of a person hmm. so the point is that the so called non personal data hmm. will become immediately personal hmm. once you collaborate it with larger outside information, so called mm. side information, bring in the whole thing. Mm. And this is a challenge of understanding this non-personal data. And this is the worst vulnerability of non-personal data. Mm. It should still not be the overall, the overall data that I revealed that, that, that unit, right? Mm. So in this case, different movies and their ratings, mm. it should not be so unique mm. that it's uh, Sultan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It helps in singling out a person who is yeah, an outlier. It should or... not allow me to figure out who did this. It Absolutely. should have enough. Uh, yeah, if, if you see that DC Manzil has high rating wine, a lot of people would have given it. It was an old Raj Kapoor movie and right. many parents from uh, our era seem to like it. Yeah, it may have high rating. That's fine. But if you reveal five more mm. and then it's a very unique mm. rating combination, perhaps mm. helps you identify a person. Mm. Absolutely. Somebody much younger watching that and then watched uh, some other set of things, maybe a unique attribute, unique, unique set of attributes for him. And then he may be uh, singled out in a data set. And then, exactly. you know, other exactly. attacks can be launched on him. Yeah. So great. The context of personal and non-personal data um, is very, very interesting. Now, uh, what is data protection impact assessment? Why is it important? Why, why companies have to do it? Okay. This term data protection impact assessment, uh, it, which appears also in the upcoming data privacy bill is to understand how an enterprise can uh, compromise privacy of its users. It's for their own understanding. If they have to 
comply with some regulation, larger regulation. They should at least be aware of what kind of vulnerabilities do their processes mm. impose. Mm. And so for some companies which are in the business of selling data, this is uh, straightforward. You can immediately imagine that, yeah, you, they may make a mistake and there may be some vulnerabilities. But there are more complex companies with more complex data pipelines where the data is being shuffled across different teams within the company and then sometimes to a third party product outside the company and then analytic insight is brought in and uh, and, and brought it back, right? So who knows with the ML ops that are emerging, the life cycle of your data within a company, which, which I give to a Google locally after buying a device in India, who knows where all that data goes, right? And mm. what kind of models are used on it? Mm. So what is required is that the company should evaluate the impact, impact of their data analysis on the data. They should be very aware of what can happen because of their data pipelines to my privacy, their customers' privacy, who has contributed their data to the company. And uh, as I described earlier, simply by hiding my name and you know my few personal attributes, personal identifiers, uh, this won't stop revealing more about me. Uh, in fact, many companies end up revealing even personal identifiers, etc. Mm. Yeah, that's because it's such a complex ecosystem. So to prevent such accidents, the law is evolving to require DPIA, uh, data protection impact assessment, when you share data between different uh, players in your company ecosystem. Absolutely, as you were saying, you know, you know, nobody would know that 251 is an outlier. People may just see that it's another height, and then they will say, oh, okay, we okay. can give it. But when they see that, oh, this is 251, and then uh, if it if it puts a flag that oh this is this is sort of an outlier this may result in re-identifying of that person then it would be very powerful for the company to say okay whether to release it or not how to release it and things like those is that right yeah yeah you actually pointed out an attack right there that if there's an outlier right and if, and if that outlier uh, so outliers can result in breach of uh, privacy hmm. that's for sure true awesome yeah. oh. So that definition of you know data protection impact assessment and its uh, use case is very very interesting. Now, um, what are the challenges with contemporary technologies? The way businesses have been doing protecting things. Uh, what are the challenges? Why why do they require to do these new things? And what are the new set of technologies which are coming, which can help uh, companies mitigate this? Because once they visualize the challenge, let us say with data protection impact assessment, how will they mitigate these and how will they continue their businesses without an impact? Mm -hmm. So firstly, uh, let's, let's agree on what is contemporary technology, right? So let's say a company, what they would do even traditionally is they will hide your name. They will hide your personal identifiers. Mm -hmm. This can be called as anonymization. I will not, I will not reveal your name, your phone number, your address. And mm -hmm. This we have heard, this kind of narrative we have heard that we don't let your name known to anyone. Mm -hmm. So that's anonymization. Second thing they can do is they can try to, uh, you know, pseudo anonymize. They can mm -hmm. uh, group things. They can let you know about, uh, mm -hmm. they, they can put stars somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's another kind of anonymization. Mm -hmm. Third thing they can do is something more sophisticated. They can mm -hmm. uh, do sort of a hashing of each mm -hmm. identifier, replace mm -hmm. it with a token. So it's a hidden secret thing mm. or a randomized thing, which mm. people will not be able to get any information mm. about. Mm. This is already perhaps a little bit more than contemporary, but these are the sort of techniques which mm. people would have traditionally done. Mm. What has been happening over the past two, three decades, two decades for sure, which is slightly mm. longer, mm. Uh, starting with the work of uh, Sweeney Latanya to the best of my knowledge. And mm. of course, some of these techniques go mm. uh, way back. Mm. Is that people have started understanding that even if I, what we just discussed, even if I introduce this non-personal data, if mm. it's so unique mm. that it tells me about you, mm. then that will be a breach of privacy. Mm. There are various techniques that have emerged mm. to address these kind of challenges. Mm. Uh, these techniques, which uh, are sometimes called privacy enhancing technologies, PET, mm. what they, they can, they are of various categories. Uh, they're easy to understand heuristically, but mm. the, but these are algorithmic techniques with a lot of details. So for instance, I can always add noise to data, mm. but if I add too much noise, the value of data goes away. Mm. So I no add noise very carefully so that there's a nice balance between the value of, uh, the data and the privacy. And this kind of techniques are sometimes analyzed in a framework called differential privacy. Mm. Mm. This is a, this is a sort of a very hot topic in computer science research. 
Right. If you search for differential privacy, you will see papers at top conferences in computer science and even machine learning. Right. There's a there's another another class of techniques where you take the whole database and you group records in a way that uh, they are in larger groups bunched together. There is no set of values of non-personal data which have very few entries. Okay. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it takes away the uniqueness of data. So these kind of techniques, which are, are called k-anonymization, uh, there are other metrics, k-anonymization, t-closeness. So these are more advanced techniques which allow you to process your data in a way that first, privacy is preserved, and second, still you get some value out of the data. Not some, but get a lot of value out of the data. In fact, uh, differential privacy uh, is has also been implemented in some application. Apple, I think, uh, implements it in collecting statistics about applications on the phone. I think uh, LinkedIn implemented in Chrome uh, for in some form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, LinkedIn as well. I think it it implements differential privacy in seeing who has seen what without actually revealing. Uh, once we have enough sp statistical information only, then they will publish something nice. like that. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. So typically in places where you are collecting data from users and you want to give some aggregate statistics like histograms, mm -hmm. that, that's the most natural place to implement these kind of techniques. Great. Um, so this, these are set of mitigation tools which on implementing organizations will have much more liberty to share data without violating privacy, right? Yeah, and in fact, the, the gold standard would be that once someone can write a mathematical theorem, mm. saying that once I implement this technique, mm. then this data is indeed non-personal. Mm. Probably it will not reveal any personal information, right? Mm. Mm. And so therefore I can do whatever I want to do. Exactly, it. which is what no startups like us are behind. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, great. So uh, so as a business, uh, right, for example, uh, uh, telco or a healthcare or uh, you know insurance company as a business where should a company start the privacy journey because it's it, it's really a lot of things and uh, they have to start somewhere and ensure that they move progress towards you know think we spoke like you know privacy using privacy enhancing technology just at the other end of the spectrum they should start somewhere so what do you think businesses should do how do they uh, how do they start their privacy journey okay this is a tough question right now. This is an evolving process. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say they started the way they start their security journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, there are a few frameworks that have evolved, mm -hmm. which talk at length how privacy planning can be included in the uh, in the from day one, mm -hmm. in the basic processes of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, Lindum is a L-I-N-D-D-U mm -hmm. and Lindum is a is one example framework mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm online another one nist provides up some point some framework nist yeah. is the national institute of standards and technology provides another framework uh, so firstly you have to include privacy preserving methods in your pipeline in your processing pipe in your processes mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. just like you do for security mm -hmm. and then you have to bring in this dpia mm -hmm. you have to bring in a method for assessment of mm -hmm. privacy into your framework Hmm. into your company hmm. and then if you see that there are some serious breaches maybe you can even go ahead and bring in some pet technologies hmm. uh, maybe going ahead later hmm. in future but at the very least it's important to become aware of your breaches on day hmm. that's hmm. currently that's where everyone should start they should at least have a handle on how their process looks so in security in, uh, in security research there is this notion of threat modeling hmm. okay where you sit down and understand your process your protocol hmm. and see what are the vulnerabilities? Where is the source of my belief that this is a secure model? Am, am I assuming that no one can hack my hardware? Hmm. Am I assuming that no one can change my source code? What hmm. am I assuming? Hmm. So when Apple makes a tight phone, hmm. like the way they do, uh, which, which no one can access from outside about device, some things are exposed, but most things are not exposed. App developers, developers can develop apps, but they can't go deeper and access some further hmm. They have an assumption about their security. They say, okay, looks like no one can actually go and access these, these, these interfaces. Mm -hmm. And based on that, I can have some kind of security. Similarly, they need to understand their privacy. What are the assumptions I'm making to claim mm -hmm. that this is private? So they should understand their uh, processes well and mm -hmm. have a detailed assessment of mm -hmm. potential privacy leakages in their processes. Mm -hmm. So something like pen test for security, you're saying we should have for privacy so that they visualize the risk and then they start the journey. 
Absolutely, absolutely. If they can visualize, it's even better. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, um, you know, so privacy for you know in the getting into a digital era, privacy sounds like you know getting into a lot of things happening. You know, with uh, Web three point zero coming, metaverse. So, are we getting into completely new digital experiences? And uh, what is the importance of privacy in all these new emerging uh, frameworks in the future of internet? Yeah, metaverse. <laughs> metaverse is crazy it's it's to begin with a marketing gimmick but mm. the technologies uh, mm. if a if a powerhouse like facebook is doing it mm. the kind of technologies that are going into it the ai vr world mm. and uh, i since i come from academic circles mm. i see where ai vr world is and how these technologies are mm. so we are headed to a future where our data if if we share our data mm. then we will get access to products which are out of out of the world right now they are next level it's like i i can't imagine it because imagine you talk about just cellular technology to someone in the 1970s and we mm. what are you talking about how can i talk when i am traveling around mm. it will be of that level right 30 20 years down the line we can imagine that our data will be used for all these many different frameworks mm. uh and the question is what will be the implication of that what will be the privacy implication of that probably we the benefit Probably we will speak about you know privacy for our digital avatars not just for me but for my digital avatar as well absolutely <laughs> see uh, one can imagine the utility very clearly mm. if i am immersed in this kind of an ecosystem mm. uh, then i can imagine very clearly that i can walk around i can build several marketing products around it right i what if i can sell something to you you get to touch and feel it e- mm. e-commerce is already delivering it to me Yeah. but what is lacking right now i'm not sure if you agree with this i feel that what is lacking right now is that i don't like the experience of selecting the product it's mm. not great i have to get it then send it back if i don't like it let's just mm. think mm. if i can touch wear it feel it imagine yeah. that kind of an ecosystem yeah, yeah 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 i would love that product people would love that product. you know fashion industry you can wear the dress your 3d avatar can wear the dress and then you can see how right. it looks like and then you can take a decision but but to enable that avatar Hmm. what data is needed from me hmm. and what are the potential abuses to that data hmm. we have to be cognizant of the potential threats hmm. of the entire country of 1.3 hmm. billion giving this data to uh, to enterprises hmm. uh, see the these things move so slowly hmm. and uh, converge to some points hmm. and i don't think we are aware of basic vulnerabilities that can happen when you give away all data about you and identity theft we typically understand in terms of uh, in terms of you know financial implications but there are much more serious implications and there is this amazing netflix series called uh, black mirror and it looks very futuristic but suddenly it was very futuristic 2 years ago yeah but it's right here many no, this, we are already there right <laughs> yeah okay. so those are all very scary futuristic things but i just realized that most of those things have already started mm. and uh, so we need not be scared of it it's a it's a doable thing it's mm. and, and already governments have made first move towards it indian government also has made first move towards it mm. and so this privacy law when it comes in it will allow us to develop these technologies and extend its benefit to the larger population absolutely this is very very exciting uh, i'm sure all our viewers would suddenly love um this angle of it as well very much uh, because all digital experiences are tied to it and as you said you know we don't know what are the possibilities which evolve out of it you know there can be one digital avatar for example we are just giving our you know physical structure or our dimensions for testing a dress but who knows where it is being used it can be you know let's say even if the intentions are good but there is a data breach and then that information is used for somebody else for something else uh without our consent and our reputation is at stake because of that uh, and it is at population scale uh, yeah. these are really and then you know it's all connected to for example web 3.0 it's all connected to your asset digital currency is associated to it um it becomes very very tricky it becomes financial it becomes reputational yeah the potential yeah. is even so so these models as you said uh, you know these have to privacy sort of very very fundamental uh to all this if i can add just one thing it, i also think that it is of absolute uh, it is absolutely essential mm. that such data systems develop mm. uh, uh for governance point of view as well mm. 
Mm-hmm. The Indian government can extend many schemes mm-hmm. because it has this way to access individuals digitally through data. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, we can all be scared of privacy and say, let's not have those schemes. That's not the right answer. That's a very regressive answer. That's putting very little trust in our scientists and our engineers as in of humanity. I think it's, we can do much more than that. We can preserve privacy and do that. We, should, we, need not, we need not shy away from these models. This is the right way forward. We should have these digital models. We should have digital engagement of our citizens. And we should preserve their privacy. Both of, the, both of these things. Awesome. Thank you so much, Himanshu. It's a, it's a, I think it was a great discussion. Um, we are saying that you know, it's a very powerful statement that we can privacy preserve at the same time enable businesses to do things in a much better, much futuristic uh, way. Um, Thank you so much. Looking forward to discuss more. Um, Let us see how, uh, what are the interactions and what are, what are users feeling about it? Yeah, great. I look forward to other uh, interviews in your series, other interaction in your series. Thank you so much, Simanshu. Speak to you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.